I'm John Buchanan. Now, one of the very first videos I made on this channel was called Velocity Control Three Ways. And what that did was to introduce the concept of velocity. And of course, many people find what velocity does initially quite confusing, particularly if they're new to um, working with logic or indeed any form of music technology which can use velocity as a controller. Because nine times out of 10, probably even as many as 99 times out of 100, or 990, shall I stop that now? Usually, velocity is used to control volume. And of course, when we think about it, that makes perfect sense. If we play any acoustic instrument, particularly a piano, if we play gently, a note gently, then of course we get a note with lower volume. But it isn't only volume that changes that when we start increasing the strength of the keys that we press and that we hit. As we press them harder, not only do the notes get louder, they tend to get brighter and other things change too. So rather than velocity simply being a, vol a volume control, it can be a controller for many, many things. And that means that, of course, we could use it for other things beyond the things we tend to use it for. I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. What I've got within this project is a bunch of things that are muted because that's just a tantalizing prospect to keep you watching. And then what I'm going to do is to add one of Logic's excellent synthesizers to the list of, um, or to the uh, unassigned track that I've got here at the top. I'm going to add the ES2. It's in my most recent list. I can also find it in synthesizers, but also if I know its name, I can, of course, just type it, start typing its name, and it will uh, pop up at the top of the list. And from the list of sounds here, what I'm also going to do is to come and find a sequence element, which is called Fat Analog. Okay, we've got this note here which is monstrously loud. What I'm going to do straight away is to uh, drop the overall volume level a little bit. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to synchronize um, the oscillator start. I'm going to go from free to soft. And what that does is just to kind of smooth out the way that the oscillator behaves in terms of at the point at which it triggers each time. And that's nice, and it's completely consistent. Now, the only thing you'll find frequently with synth sounds that are this percussive is that you'll sometimes get a bit of a tick on the front, a little bit like kick drums that have got a hi-hat attached to them. We're hearing a kind of spiky tick on them as well. And often that can be slightly regulated or just made less by ever so slightly increasing the attack time of the volume envelope, which I'm gonna do here with the attack time slider. And rather than this really sharp spike on the front, what I'm going to get is something which is just a tiny bit smoother, so we just get a little bit less of that. And the next thing to do now is just to record a sequence. I'm going to go for this note E. And what I want to do is just to get a little bit of something syncopated in here, I think. deliberately quite random. Okay, look, I'm really sorry to interrupt because that was good, wasn't it? And it's going to be good again in, I reckon, about 22 seconds. But between now and then, I just need to tell you about learn.johnobuchananmusic.com. So this is the website where the courses that I'm making to allow you to take deeper dives into a lot of what we do here on YouTube are now hosted. So on there, what we've got are three courses all about um, sampled orchestral music. So if you want to learn how to make orchestral music within Logic Pro, those courses are for you. And I also have a new course out, which is called Discovering Logic Pro. If you're brand new to music production, you know that Logic Pro can do amazing things, but you don't want to learn about the Haas effect just yet, because what you actually want to do is to ask some of the more basic starting questions in order to begin your musical journey within Logic Pro. That course is for you as well. That's quite enough of this version of me. Let's go back to the other one. Okay, what I'm going to do is just to see what the 16th note does for us to give us a little bit of extra random. We'll come back to exactly what I've done there in a little while. But yeah, I kind of like the idea that maybe Quantize is going to have an effect on the way that this sound is going to behave. Okay, now of course, this video is all about velocity and I haven't even mentioned it once. So the first thing we're going to do is to regulate all velocities by Coming to the dynamics um, drop down, I'd love to know how many times I've done this on this channel. We're going to come to dynamics and select fixed, and we're going to produce a velocity offset of let's say 30, which is going to be quite bold. And then what I'm going to do is to bake that in by pressing control and N. And you know that all already because I've done that a million times before. What that does is to make every single one of these velocities 94. So fixed makes them 64, and I've added a velocity offset of 30. A little bit of basic math takes us to 94. 
Okay, now it's time to talk about velocity more sensibly. So, of course, as we know within the ES2, what we've effectively got is the oscillator section here, we've got the filter section here, and then we've got the amplifier section here where we've got a volume control and a range of other things that we can do, which allow us to just control the way that the amp behaves, including adding distortion or uh, bringing in things like uh, chorus flanging and phasing if we want. What we've then got at the bottom is a series of controllers, two LFOs and a series of envelopes and things that we can use to shape those sounds. And then in the middle, we have our matrix of modulation possibilities. This is where we can take the controllers down at the bottom and some other ones, including the keyboard itself, and we can then map those to particular parameters in order to shape the sounds in different ways. And at the moment, velocity is being used to do one thing, and that is it is controlling the amount that envelope 2, which is here, is going to affect the cutoff frequency. In other words, what that means is that envelope 2 is shaping the filter cutoff, and it does that more when I press the notes loudly and less when I press them more gently. And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. I'm going to take the overall assignment of that down to somewhere near the middle, where if there were no velocity control, there wouldn't be much envelope shaping of cutoff 2 from envelope two. And to really demonstrate that point, what I'm gonna do is to take the velocity assignment for that parameter down as well. What that means now is that it doesn't matter how hard I press the note, we won't hear velocity affecting the way that the cutoff feels within this filter. There are quiet notes. and there are really hard notes and they make no difference. What happens when I start introducing velocity? Well, what we're gonna find is that the quiet notes sound the same, But now I can affect the tone of the sound using velocity, and I can make that more extreme by simply dragging the uppermost limit of that up to somewhere near the top. And again, quiet velocities or gentle velocities will still be very muted. But we now get extra spike on those ones that I press a bit harder. Okay, so we now know what velocity does and how it can be rooted. And I am going to keep in a little bit of that, but what I'm going to do is to raise the overall lower limit so that we get a little bit of envelope spike even at really low velocities and a bit less at the higher ones. Okay, but what if we were decided we wanted to use velocity to control something completely other, like for instance, pitch? Well, that would be weird. That basically means that loud velocities or high velocities, notes that I play strongly, would be higher than their intended notes, and notes potentially that I played really quietly could potentially be lower. It's all about the range that we set up. Why would we do that? Well, we've looked at the idea of detune in previous videos, and actually this is going to be another way of us just being able to get a little bit creative with pitch. So how would I go about doing that? Well. Firstly, I can see that the sound that I'm playing is made up of two oscillator sources, one and two. So what I need to do firstly is to choose a target of the pitch bases that I want to change. And I can either just choose one, oscillator one or oscillator two or oscillator three, albeit oscillator three isn't being used in this sound, or I can choose all of the oscillators. And I'm gonna do that, it catches all of them and it means that they'll all move together. And then what I'm going to do is to change the source assignment. What that does is to change the parameter that is changing the pitch from an LFO to, well, I'm going to come and find a velocity, which is here. So directly what that now means is that the potential is there for velocity to control pitch. Now, when I say the potential for it, what do I mean? Well, remember, I have used fixed on the velocities overall to make them all 94. So what I'm going to do is to press play now, and I don't think we're going to hear an E anymore, but what we are going to hear is a repeating note that's playing over and over again, and the reason it's just going to be the same pitch is because all of the velocities are the same. I know you're starting to see the fun in this now, aren't you? Okay, so why is the pitch getting higher when I push the uh, little green triangle higher? Well, of course, it means that the effect that velocity can have on pitch is becoming more extreme. So the more extreme I make it, the higher the pitch will rise. 
fine. Except that, of course, at the moment, I am having to manually adjust that in order for us to hear that pitch changing. And the whole idea of using velocity is that I don't want to have a slider that controls pitch. I want velocity to do it. So what I'm now going to do is to make the ES2 a little bit smaller if I can. Oh, look, I really can. Tiny ES2. Ah. Ah. OK, and then what I'm going to do is to open up my uh, little sequence of notes. And here I can see what I mentioned before, that we only have this kind of fixed um, velocity control for it. All of the notes, in other words, have the same velocity. But what if I start experimenting with that? So what I'm going to do is to make the first note a bit brighter, and then I'm going to just make all of these notes just ramp up a little bit. And I'm going to do that in a series of bars. So even though the pattern is varying, because of course I played it slightly randomly and the quantizers put it in time for us, but nevertheless it's doing something a little bit weird, a little bit strange, nevertheless what I'm going to do is to make sure that every bar has got a kind of ramp. So the first note is going to be bright. I keep saying the word bright. I don't really mean bright, I just mean a high velocity assignment. And after that we've got a series of ramps. And if we come back and make the ES2 a little bit bigger again so you can actually see it, what we're going to discover is that what that means is that the quieter velocities are going to keep the pitch closer to the original note that I've recorded. And then, of course, as those velocities climb and begin to get higher, what's going to happen is that the pitch is going to change. And that sounds like this. And if I want that to be more extreme, of course, I can just push the velocity controller up a little bit higher. That means that the brighter, harder, more strongly hit velocities are going to be higher in pitch, and the lower ones, again, are going to stick closer to the original note. Now these two assignments can work side by side. And when I talk about the two assignments, I'm talking about this one, which we've set up, and the original velocity control over the cutoff frequency. So if what I want is for the low notes to be closer in pitch to the original note, which they are because they're lower velocities, but I want those notes to be a little bit brighter, what I need to do is to raise the lowest possible point that they can reach from an envelope to assignment to cut off to via velocity. Now there's a sentence, at the same time as leaving the velocity assignment to pitch one, two, and three the same. That's really nice. Okay, a couple of things. This sound is really bassy. So I'm going to punch an EQ on this. I'm just going to roll out a little bit of the bass, especially bear in mind one of the other sounds I've got within this project, which we're going to hear in a minute, I promise, is a kind of sub. So I kind of want this to be more of a sort of spitting sequence sound rather than one that's providing all of this extra bass. So I'm just going to roll a few frequencies out using a 12 dB per octave slope from about 65 um, hertz downwards. Again, we'll probably need to adjust that when we bring in the other elements. The other thing is it sort of feels like it might be quite nice to put a bit of reverb on this sound, which I'm going to do via um, a, uh, an auxiliary bus, the first available one. We won't need a ton of this, I don't think, but I'm just going to put um, the Quantec Room Simulator on this sound, um, and that's going to be good for us. I think I want this to be a little bit bright, just picking out the higher frequency content, and we'll make the reverb time just a little bit longer as well. Okay, that sounds like this. And the reason why that's so nice is because we're getting all of those little pitch spikes and they're now going into a reverb and we get the kind of legacy of that as well. It almost sounds like the reverb has got some pitch offsets. Okay, you've waited long enough. Let's listen to that in the context of this whole track. Thank you. 
what's kind of irresistible is sort of chasing the pitch. As it climbs because of that assignment, it's kind of fun to grab the little green triangle and drag it down at exactly the same time. And what that does is to produce this kind of weird you trying to kind of tune the sound that you deliberately detuned. And of course, what that does the whole time is just to throw up these tiny little pitch offsets, which actually I can't really imagine producing in a different way. I suppose we could do that with an LFO, but if I want the kind of randomness of that, a movement, and particularly if I decided that the next obvious thing to do would be to automate this little green triangle assignment so that I was keeping some pitches closer to the original pitch and then they started to warp and wonk out and do all the good usual things that I'm, I'm drawn to so much, then of course I couldn't really do that with an LFO in quite the same way. So I think using velocity to control pitch is a really interesting new creative possibility um, and we now know how to do it. It's definitely worth thinking about and looking along the line if you're working with the ES2 to do this to see whether or not a velocity is already doing something else. It's far more likely to be in one of these little via controls, in other words, to interrupt an existing assignment which is maybe using an envelope or an LFO to produce something and maybe velocity is there just to act as a kind of controller for that. So definitely if you find that you're making some changes and other things about the sound seem to be changing as well, that's going to be because velocity is already being used somewhere else. But I think as a controller for pitch, velocity can do some really interesting things, particularly if you also like wonk in the same way that I do. Who doesn't?